Ladies and gentlemen, uh, can I welcome you on behalf of the Giants to uh, what we hope is going to be a very entertaining lunch today. Um, all of you are very special guests and, uh, and great friends of the Giants and a particular welcome to members of the Captain's Club and Chairman's Council um, and a more particular welcome uh, to somebody who's recently uh, joined the Captain's Club and, and back involved with the club and uh, can you put your hands together for Dale Holmes, who's here today? Uh, Dale and I worked together for a long time on the AFL executive and, uh, and collaborated on a lot of things. We've had many memorable trips together, particularly given today's um, a talent theme. I think he cut his teeth in Ireland uh, as we followed a, an AIS Academy trip around. And, uh, and learnt what we could, spent a lot of long hours discussing strategies and, and pathways and, uh, and you can rest assured, uh, the people in this room that, um, from our club's point of view, um, Dale Holmes will always, uh, be regarded as someone who's got a massive legacy at this club. He put many of the fundamentals in place and it's just great to have his ongoing support. Um, this week's an important week for the industry, for the AFL and to have the NAB AFL Under-16 Championships in Sydney is a very significant thing. Uh, we thank uh, Kevin Sheehan and Andrew Demucho and, and others at the AFL who continue to bring events like this to Sydney. Um, I think it's something that the AFL needs to continue to look to do. They've got a lot of major events that are held in Melbourne uh, and not enough outside of Melbourne in my view. So to have the Under-16s here is very important. Um, they're playing games in Blacktown. They played games at Skoda Stadium during the week, which was absolutely fantastic to see. Uh, and we'd like to continue to build this event in Sydney. We've taken the opportunity, as you can see from today's agenda, to engage several key people who I think are some of the uh, leading thinkers, not just in, uh, in the AFL industry, but sport in general. We'll hear shortly from Kevin Sheehan, Scott Clayton, Peter Schwab, Michael O'Loughlin and our own Stephen Silvani who this week was named in the uh, many, I think the multicultural team of champions on Tuesday. So can you put the ha your hands together for Stephen? He hasn't had much recognition over the course of his career, so to be named in something this week, uh, I know it was a great thrill for him um, and, uh, and something that uh, he'll add to, I think he's actually put an extra room on his house uh, for some of these awards, but uh, great to have Stephen in. Anthony Kutafidis, who was also named in it, was uh, at Tom Wills Oval yesterday with the World 18 uh, that he's coaching and uh, renewed acquaintances with Stephen. Also want to welcome some of our Giants players who've come through the pathway that we'll be talking about today. We've got on table five, Stephen Cornelio. Uh, so make Stephen welcome. And Stephen represented Western Australia through this pathway and also Taylor Adams. I'm trying to work out which table he's on. It's just over on table seven here next to Dale. So make Taylor welcome. Um, and Dean Brogan, who is a, a playing coach with the clubs also here. So Dean, thanks for coming along and we'll hear from these guys a bit later. We're creating our own pathway through the Slater and Gordon Giants Academy and it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Paul Moore who's a significant supporter of what we're trying to do in, in particular in bringing uh, kids through Western Sydney. So Paul, thanks for your support of the club and the academy. Uh, despite not having won a game so far, the club's in, in good shape in my view. I think we're heading in the right direction. We certainly have full confidence in the plan and the plan from a footy point of view was set several years ago. 
you've read this week uh, and in, in the weeks uh, leading up that um, we're going to be very active in trading and in recruiting and some of the discussion today will centre on that. Um, but off-field membership is up something like 24%. Club-generated revenue, the revenue that we get outside of what the AFL gives us, is up about 23%. So we're very pleased with uh, how we're tracking and we're just really looking forward to, at some stage in the next year or two, capitalising on on-field performance. We've got three home, home games to go. Yesterday we announced the Many Cultures game that we're going to play against Melbourne on August the 3rd. Um, which we uh, really want to embrace the diversity of Western Sydney. We've got Kevin Sheedy's last ever game in, uh, in Sydney against the side that he played with in Richmond. That's coming up as well. So I think that's going to be a special celebration and uh, encourage you guys to, uh, to come and have a look um, at the three home games to come. I want to now introduce uh, our keynote speaker, a guest speaker who will then join a panel uh, that Nick Johnson's going to facilitate. Uh, Kevin Sheehan played 102 games at Geelong and uh, I, as many of you knew, know, grew up in Geelong and uh, instead of putting Kevin's number eight on my jumper as a kid, I made the fatal mistake of putting 14, which is David Clark and a lot of the people in this room work in the finance industry and a well-known um, Clark's performance with Pyramid, which uh, ended up costing my family a lot of money. We moved from a four-bedroom house in Newtown into a one-bedroom place uh, uh, on the outskirts of Geelong. Um, I remember one day going to footy training when I was 10 and I was uh, running late and mum had washed the number 14 David Clark jumper and she hung it over the heater to try to dry it and the uh, the jumper started burning in the end and I should have known then that there was some sort of sign of what was to come. Um, but Kevin Sheehan uh, is famous in our house too because Pyramid also put out a, a set of footy cards. I think David Clark put out about seven versions of his own card. But there was a um, there was a card with Kevin and a number of the other players. And I remember as a kid collecting these things. And uh, 102 games at Geelong. But his impact on the game's gone on to be very, very significant. He's worked for 30 years in developing the game. He's a visionary in my view. He's somebody who challenges uh, what we do. He doesn't just do... Uh, what was done last year, he comes up with new initiatives uh, on a regular basis and in many ways he has a lot in common with our own Kevin Sheedy. Um, he's somebody who, whose passion for the game um, I think you'll see is very evident in what he, what he wants to talk to us about today um, and he's the architect of I think many of the great programs and initiatives including the NAB under 16s that's on at the moment. Um, Earlier this year, he's fittingly rewarded with an Order of Australia um, for his contribution to football and to youth development. And uh, as a lead-in to introducing him, I've just, we've just put a photo up of the 1984 Teal Cup squad. And you'll see if you can look closely. Uh, seated in the first row is Kevin Sheehan, uh, adorning a famous moustache that he's since removed. Um, and up the back right-hand corner, if you've got keen eyes, you can see our own Stephen Silvani. So Kevin Sheehan, team manager of the Teal Cup in 1984 with our own Stephen Silvani in the team. It's, um, it's just a great image for me of, about how the game evolves and how it develops and uh, what a pathway it sets for people like Stephen who's gone on to be full back of the century and, uh, and now working full time in the game. But um, can you please make welcome uh, our keynote speaker today, Kevin Sheehan from the AFL. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dave, and uh, ladies and gents, uh, a pleasure to be here today. Gee, I look at that picture and uh, I also see a guy called Alan Swab. It makes me think back to my, one of my first meetings up here in Sydney to do with footy. It was even prior to that. It was about 1980, I reckon. I was working for Geelong. I was a player at Geelong and uh, Alan Swab asked me to come up here and sit down with the, uh, the Junior League people. I remember eight people in a room and uh, I had to put this concept to them on what we planned to do. And the plan was that we would uh, bring up the best known VFL players, fly them all up and would bus in all the kids of the schools of Sydney and would have this wonderful event out there in the SCG announcing that the VFL was going to push up this way. Now, of course, I'm sitting there with these people that love the game, football followers that administered the junior comp, and they looked at me stupid and said, no one will turn up. Your aerial ping pong down there, 
they don't know our game. The schools won't engage. So I don't take no for an answer too often. I had to take the no. I went back to Alan Swab and said, we're a long way off it. And it was at that stage that the following year, there were a few games played. I think I played in one. I think Geelong played Melbourne up here. This is all the precursor to the Swans. So if you look 33 years on as to what can happen in a market, uh, it, it, it means that we have to have long-term vision in whatever we do. A story from 84 from, well, uh, the first job at the AFL was to manage some of the teams. So this is all about talent, I suppose, as a lead into what I'll talk about, our business of talent. Thrown in to manage kids like young Soss, the 16-year-olds of Victoria, and bring them up here. It was to Sydney too. We played that national championship up in Sydney. Another 16-year-old by the name of Gary Lyon. I think he's had a fair career as well. They were the boys we looked after. Then it was a month or two later, and I'll just tell one story before we get into the serious business that will stick with me forever. And this, this is my first experience, I suppose, in serious match committees. Pick and players, talent ID if you like. And our circumstance was this, and that you guys, most of you, and, and ladies will, uh, will know of two very famous people in our game, legendary figures, one a great coach, and one a great, well, the greatest personality in the game that I ever met. The people are the coach was Alan Jeans, Yabby Jeans, who we lost, unfortunately, just in the last 12 months or so. The coach of Hawthorne at the time, but also the coach of Victoria in state of origin. That reward went to the, pre the premiership coach from the previous year. So there's Yabby Jeans on the one hand, and the famous Mr. Football was Teddy Whitten, the Victorian chairman of selectors. They were the personalities I was working with as I was the team manager for this state of origin game. The circumstances were that there was a player at Geelong that Hawthorne had cleared for about 60,000, but only played a handful of games at Hawthorne and only a handful at Geelong. And Witten, who called all the games at Geelong, wanted to pick him in the state of origin side after about eight games. That's how well he was going. And he'd come to me before the meeting. And I think you guys and girls that go to meetings, you've got to lobby before meetings. You have to do your homework if you're going to get something up, whatever the point might be. So he's come to me and said, how do we get this Gary Ablett kid up who is ch playing some amazing footy? They already reckon he's better than Dennis Marshall, one of their greats, and he could be as good as Polly Farmer, their greatest ever player. And they're the comments Witten's making six to seven games into his career. So we go to Yabby in the meeting, and Yabby Jeans was very, very famous for his three phases in the game. In essence, the three phases mean you, you either got the ball, it's in dispute, well, the other side's got it, and you've got to chase them and get it, and it's called going the other way. And so Teddy started off with, we've got to put the boy in. The boy looks like he's going to be pretty special. And Yabby just dropped the glasses down on the end of the nose and started with his three phases of the game. He won't go the other way. And Witten just exploded. He doesn't need to go the other way. He's a champion. You don't have to chase and tackle if you've got the ball the whole time. And Yabby's come back with things like, he's a strange lad. He mightn't even turn up. He said, I'll pick him up. He'll be my boy. Well, my boy was picked up by Ted Whitten. He got on that plane, went to Perth, and kicked eight goals in his state debut, his 16th senior game, and in my view went on to be well, the greatest player to watch I've ever seen. Not the most consistent, but the most brilliant player where you would drive for hours just to see one of Gary Ablett Sr.'s games. He was an amazing player. And I was just a small part of the fly on the wall as that match committee tried to sort out whether you play him or not. So somehow that's ended up the business I work in. And I just want to give you a feel for it before we bring our panel up, the sort of terminology that's coming to our game, why it's used, and uh, I suppose, uh, again, how we've pinched a little bit from uh, other good ideas. Don't have to be original all of the time. And sometimes we, and in this case with our draft, etc., we look to the States. Alan Swab and Dick Sednett were, back in the early 80s, looked at the NBA and the NFL to come up with our model as our game started to expand. We just have a look at the business of talent. And if you recognise a couple of images up there, you see Jack Watson, Nick Natanui, two young boys in 2008 that were in our draft. Which one do you take? We don't always get it right because you're crystal balling. You're trying to work out how they'll end up in three or four years' time. So we have a draft entry age of 18, and we'll never get it perfect. Uh, and, and there will be those that can't, I suppose, handle the pressure cooker that is AFL. It's a standard way above anything else they've competed in. And it's not just the standard play. It's the full-time environment, the scrutiny you're under the whole time, and some just can't cut it, and that's the way it will always be. So despite people always saying that, uh, that, that someone will be a champion, we're all 
living with a hope that they'll end up getting there, that there are no absolute certainties. So in this business, we do compete. And we don't often say it publicly, and we're only whispering it publicly here, I suppose. But many of these kids are very, very good at a range of sports. And so you have to have a strategy to try and win their hearts and minds. Press it on. This is what has been built, I suppose, uh, over the, the time that I've been in the game and have been, uh, I suppose, an observer at times, maybe an initiator in other, in other circumstances of what we call our pathway, our pathway that's sponsored by the NAB. And if we just even start up toward the top with our draft, it's a little bit uh, faint at the top, but you'll see the word draft. Uh, and that was introduced, if you go back in your history, 86. It was the year before the West Coast Eagles and Brisbane joined the comp for the simple reason is we had to distribute talent. We were putting our sides and the Swans had just moved to Sydney. We didn't have enough talent to, to maintain what we called our zones. We'd had zones for 75 years. We'd had an under 19 comp for 45 years. They couldn't live as we were pushing our game to different parts of Australia. So the draft on the basis of uh, what they did in the NFL and the NBA become one of the platforms for equalization, the draft and the salary cap. And, uh, and from 86 now in its 27 year history, it has become quite an event and we'll see that right at the end. Underpinning that, we now have what's called a draft combine. Again, we've pinched the American word, but for the last four years we've called it that. It'd been a camp before that. We'd rather go with a brand that uh, has got international recognition as the testing time for talent. Show us whether you can combine your athletic ability with your skill and have you got the mental toughness to make the grade. We'll just show you a snapshot of how the combine works in a few moments' time. Underpinning that, we have our AOS AFL Academy, and we'll tell you a wee bit about it. Mickey O'Loughlin is our head coach of that, and uh, you'll hear from him a little bit later. That's been around now for 17 years, and it now has 60 of the best young talent in Australia in it every year in two tiers. And that leads us to what we're up here for, this event over this week. Our under-16 championships, we've got 12 teams from around Australia, from the South Pacific, uh, and we've also got the world team, which is a combination of multicultural Australians and boys that have come from South Africa and from Ireland in particular to make up that team. So a 12-team competition, uh, and that's after we've just finished having under 18 nationals. So this whole pathway exposes um, at the bottom end with our 16s and 18s about 600 players, all with that hope of one day finding themselves into the AFL. And that's all sponsored by the NAB. So that's our business, the business of talent. And it's an uncertain business in terms of being perfectly correct all of the time. There's the championships. We've even got to a point, um, if you see some images on swap cards, where that, they're a remarkable commodity now. Uh, Lockie Whitfield, the number one choice, was signing autographs back in about August of last year as people wanted to be to have the card of the Lockie Whitfield when in hopefully five or ten years' time he'll be regarded as a terrific player of the game. And so more than half a million of those cards were actually sold out over the period of October. We want to be the game that never goes away, that people talk about for 12 months of the year. If the games are over, they want to talk about the hope of the next step. Who's the next player to come in? And that's where the under-16 and under-18 championships fit in. Joe Danaher, the... Uh, Again, the product of the family from Hungary and New South Wales was the great hope last year and become under the father-son rule a, a selection to Essendon. We've seen some glimpses already of young Joe. You see his arms in the air as he kicks goals in last year's championship. Show you this image because uh, we can't go back to this point. There's an all-Australian photograph, photograph up there and there's some well-known boys in it. Uh, there's Ben Reid that plays for Collingwood. There's Matthew Cruiser, the number one draft choice, plays at Carlton. There's a kid called Chris Marston that's a star with the West Coast Eagles. But circled there, there's a boy that looks a little bit like Sean Burgoyne that plays for Hawthorne. That's Paddy Mills. Paddy Mills, who we let get away. So way back in 2004, he actually won the medal in our national under-15 championships. But we didn't have a program for him. We didn't have the Giants Academy. He would have been in it these days. We didn't have the Swans Academy. Um, we didn't have an offer. And so Paddy Mills was lost to the game. And I've gone back to the tapes very sadly last year, found the tapes of those games and we cut some vision. He would have been a star, an absolute star of our game. And at the time, as things go, um, it was Scott Pendlebury 
the Collingwood champion that was in the AIS basketball program that pulled out of that. He wanted to pursue AFL, went back to Gippsland, and the vacancy come for another kid to join the basketball program, and Paddy Mills joined it in Pendlebury's place. One out, one in, and one that got away. And so we'll always remind our executive of the fact that we have to have a great program at a fairly high level to get the very, very best. And Paddy Mills is one that we didn't get. Aaliyah Aaliyah, a boy over, a Sudanese boy over on the uh, extreme side there, has come up through the world team, the team that was out uh, with the Giants just during the week. He played with that three years ago and has progressed to play for Queensland in national championships and has now followed his family to Western Australia and played uh, in a key defensive position for WA in this year's championship. So we're giving boys like that the chance to really aspire to make the game that's become our game here in this country. In this, uh, without going into the detail of this, this is w what we're doing in the space of uh, our academies up, up in uh, New South Wales and Queensland. We can connect now through the academies with boys from age 10, 11, 12, right through to 18. And right at the moment, there are a thousand boys in both states that are getting some high level coaching through the academy program. And the exciting innovation for this as we go forward is that when the players are good enough, There'll be a bidding system. It'll become quite an event in its own right because if you get a young star coming through, the other clubs will be watching and it'll be like the father-son rule where the other clubs will decide on the market value. So there will be a bid to decide on what, what level that player goes. And you've got some exciting boys coming through. We've seen them in the 16s who in a couple of years' time, the club, the club, the Giants will have the chance of listing their player but then will have to uh, survive the bid, if you like, to see where his draft position becomes. So it's an innovative change and a modification to the draft that we think can really work and stir up some great interest here in, uh, in New South Wales and in Sydney. Mickey will talk about this uh, in a minute when he's up on our panel. But we, every year, pick our 60 boys, our AIS AFL Academy, and as I touched on before, they're multi-talented, uh, that's the sort of athlete we want to see in our game. Those can do extraordinary things. And we need to compete with the other sports. I look at some of the boys that, uh, that play in the AFL that, well, may have been in the Ashes side uh, playing last night. Shannon Hearn with the West Coast Eagles was a star cricketer um, that, uh, that at, at Captain Australia. Um, there's George Holland smith as a boy down at Geelong, a rising star nomination of this year again, captain the Australian under-16s across from the West Indies. So boys like that, we always have to compete with. Stephen Canillio himself was a terrific cricketer. Haven't seen him in the nets, but maybe the boys uh, at the Giants can tell us how good he was. But he was uh, obviously very appealing to the West Australian uh, Cricket Association that made him an offer as well. So we need to have the best game, the most appealing game, the best youth program, uh, so that uh, the boys that are talented will choose to come our way in the finish. The combine brand is one that we're using now internationally. Um, you see an image there of Ty Canelli. He's in Dublin, and this is early this year, taking 20 uh, young boys that play Gaelic football for a skills combine uh, as we chose a couple to come out to Australia for a tryout. We see images of our under-16 boys all in this carnival that do go through their combine as we assess their skills. And we see an image there of a big... Um, African-American by the name of Eric Wallace that has joined North Melbourne's list. And if you're reading your papers in the last 10 days up here, you'll know that the Sydney Swans have got three giants working out with them at the minute. Three boys of 201 to 207 centimetres that uh, have been training under Paul Roos for two weeks and we've seen them train in front of all of the clubs during the week as well. That's a step into another brave field, the brave field of trying to get a ruckman of Gus Seebeck's size to come out of the States. He might make the NBA, but geez, he might be the next Mike Pike that comes into our game. So that search is on as we spread our combines, not just to Ireland, but across to the States. We're nearly to the end here. Our combine now is an event in Melbourne uh, that is quite extraordinary to, uh, to see the, the level it's got to, with the best 120 players from around the nation coming in for a four-day job interview, you'd call it, in on Eddie Head Stadium, where we have a drop-in floor, uh, a high-performance sports floor that they sprint on, do their agility tests on, their beep tests on, they're interviewed by the clubs and the super boxes, and it generates enormous interest in the draft uh, coming up a few months later. That's part of the stepping stone for what we now have, and that is the draft event held up here a couple of years back. 
But now uh, we have a three-year stint on the Gold Coast. And uh, last year it got to the point that we're 100 media present. It's, uh, it's now in prime time. It's now broadcast on radio as well. Even the spectators and the fans come in. 2,500 people turn up uh, because people who are supporters and fans want hope and they see hope in young people. And the young people want opportunity. They want to see their name called out. And every year, 1,500 or more people nominate and uh, ultimately uh, around 100 get their chance on draft night to get into the AFL. So that's the spot that we work in. Uh, I work closely with the clubs. We see Stephen here and Scotty Clayton, the guys that we work across. Uh, but the, the, the beauty of this business is that we all see things slightly differently uh, in terms of talent identification and judgment. Now, different to Teddy Whitten and Alan Jeans many, many years ago. And uh, good luck to the Giants, certainly with their selections later this year. You've certainly got a dilemma right at the minute because of, it looks likely you'll, you'll hold the one, number one choice and we might debate that a little bit later. Uh, do you trade? Do you hold? What do you do with that? So it becomes the conversation that started even a couple of weeks ago. It'll run now for months as to what to do as you position yourself to, to be an all-powerful club in, in the next two to three years. So great to be along here today and we look forward to, uh, to joining a, a panel and discussing some of the issues around talent in a few minutes' time. Cheers. Uh, thanks very much, Kevin. I'm sure you can uh, you can tell if you haven't met him before that uh, he's a very very passionate advocate for the development of our game. And I think whatever organisation you're running, if you can have people who are passionate about what they do, you get great results. And I'm sure the AFL has uh, has had great results, and I know the AFL's had great results out of uh, the work Kevin Sheen's done. Um, from a, an employment point of view. He's working in a pathway that offers 800 jobs for elite athletes at an average salary of $230,000 a year. And that's a story that's not well enough told in Sydney and in New South Wales. Uh, from an awareness point of view, those opportunities exist um, even in a more real sense now through the academies and the pathways to get straight onto the Swans and Giants list. So uh, that's something that we're promoting very heavily now through the work of Lockie Buzzard. And as I said, supported by Paul Moore and the Slater and Gordon Academy. Um, as we go to our main course, we're going to see some vision of the Slater and Gordon Academy, and then we'll be back with Nick Johnson facilitating the panel. Thanks very much, Kevin. Got our, uh, our Western Sydney development squads in, which is the, the first stage, I guess, of academy selection, so the boys are back in. These guys have been selected from an extensive program pre-Christmas and have now come back, uh, first session back for their 3K time trial and, and training sessions today, leading into the academy development series, which is a series for our zone kids at 15, 16, 18 years of age, uh, for all kids where they play each other three times for selection in the academy squad. Well, we've got 75 kids representing the Slater and Gordon Giants Academy. Um, they're all from the West here, so there's 25 in the 16s, 25 in the 15s and 25 in the 18s. And as I said, those kids are playing the Riverina, Murray and Canberra based size for selection in our academy squad, which will then largely make up uh, the squad, hopefully, that, that plays the Swans to, to then have ramp selection down the track. The academy has provided uh, an experience with me playing the Giants Reserves. A couple games last year, I think I played 13. Uh, it was a good experience being amongst um, professional athletes. Oh, yeah, it's good experience, good feeling, just making mates amongst all the boys from the different regions around Sydney. So. The academy's been going for two years. Um, and great result for New South Wales kids, I guess, is providing pathways to our list. And last year we put two kids on our list, uh, the Giants, and there's 16% of our list at the moment is made up of New South Wales kids. So it's providing kids a direct pathway to the AFL and, and obviously upskilling these kids along the way to help junior footy and, and local footy become stronger. Yeah, these kids here are all from northwest um, Sydney out to the Blue Mountains, even to Bathurst and Orange, and, and down to the southwest, so Camden, uh, Picton, those sort of areas. So it's, it's predominantly Western Sydney and the 14 LGAs of Western Sydney.
saying and can be a start Tis like a baboe is still loud It's like a bad day to never end I feel the chaos around me A thing I don't try to deny I better learn to accept that There are things in my life I can't control They say love and nothing but a soul I don't even know what love is Too many tears I've had to pour Don't you know I'm so tired of it all I have no terror of these spells Finding out the secrets one will tell Whatever it is it can be named There's a part of my world that's fading away You know I don't want to be clever Never been not superior True like ice, true like fire No one knows that a breeze can blow me away No one knows there's much more dignity In a feat that I'd rather sleep to read I'm losing my balance on this high Place I ain't even playing my own game. The rules have changed. Well, I didn't know. There are things in my life I can't control. I feel the chaos around me. A thing I don't try to deny. I better learn to accept that. There's a part of my life that will go away. Dark as the night, cool as the ground. The sickly silence in my heart. There's one that strives for hell to come. I am sure I come through. I don't know how. They say a man can be a star. Feels like a bogey is still loud. I'm losing my balance on the side.
Seven days in sun and June, but long enough to bloom. Flowers on the sunbeam dress you wore in spring. Yeah, yeah. The way we left us. Ladies and gentlemen, I trust you've all enjoyed your main course and we might now get underway with our very special panel of guests we have here today. My name's Nick Johnston. I'm the General Manager of Corporate Affairs and Communications with the Giants. And before we get underway, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Darug people, in there, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It is, of course, NAIDOC Week and the Giants are involved in a number of activities with NAIDOC Week and we're very lucky today to be joined by one of the great 
Indigenous players of the AFL, Michael O'Loughlin. As I said, it's a, a terrific panel of speakers we've got here today, people who are at the very top of their trade in the AFL and who play a very influential role in shaping their game, and I'd like to introduce them now and call them up onto the stage. And as I introduce them, I'd like you to just turn your eyes to the screens as well. Could I please firstly welcome the AFL National Talent Manager, Kevin Sheehan, who we heard from earlier. And there's his old Scanlon's footy card from the old Geelong days. As Dave said, number eight, wasn't it, Kev? Correct. Uh, could I please now welcome also the Greater Western Sydney Giants list manager, Stephen Silvani. And we didn't bother with the footy cards for Sauce. You can't go past the mark. 1988 against Collingwood at the MCG. I think uh, Craig Starcevich still has nightmares about it. Could I also introduce the Gold Coast Suns list manager, Scott Clayton. Scott, there's a... There's a shot from Scotty's uh, Fitzroy days, 160 games for the Roys. The AFL Director of Coaching, Peter Schwab, also joins us today. Schwabby. I think we're supposed to have Schwabby's... Uh... Oh, here he is. At least I'm getting a king. I thought we had one with your mullet. There you go. Um, and finally... Uh, the coach of the AIS AFL Academy, Michael O'Loughlin. Of course, that's not Michael O'Loughlin. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> Where's Dave? That's, in fact, of course, Denzel Washington, who Vicky O says he bears a very strong resemblance. <laughs> that's all right. I did, yeah, yeah, quick, yeah. I did a quick check of these more guys' more records money. the other day. And it may interest you to know that they've played a combined total of 1,048 VFL, AFL games, and I think six premierships um, between the three of you. And, of course, Schwabby was the senior coach at Hawthorne as well. But their on-field achievements are only a small part of their resumes, and it's their influence off the field for which they've now forged their reputations <coughs> in recent years. List management, the draft and trading are all very topical at the moment, and I know the media table at the back have got their pens poised, so feel free to go your hardest today, guys. And we've got a lot to cover off in this discussion, and I'd like to start, I guess, with our two <laughs> club list managers, uh, Stephen Silvani and Scott Clayton, and perhaps start with you, Sos, about how you see the development in year two now of the Giants list uh, and what you're now looking at, I guess, as you go forward into years three and four. Yeah, well, obviously, um, second year in, most AFL football, second year in, is probably the toughest year. Um, you know, your first year, you generally have a free run at it as a, as a, as a uh, teenager, and uh, really clubs really don't know too much about you. So <laughs> second year um, is obviously a tougher year, and look, in a lot of ways, um, you know, our, our team would like to have done a lot better uh, to, to date. But having said that, there's still a number of games ahead, and we're still looking to, 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 to win games. But... Um, there's been some, you know, obviously some circumstances we, we couldn't, um, we, we couldn't uh, you know, I guess, avoid in terms of injuries where a guy like Corns and you know, uh, Brogues himself and Johnny Patton, who was our number one pick um, up for, and even, even a guy like um, Andrew Phillips, who, who are our bigger type bodies that uh, haven't played too many games this year. So that, that's been difficult difficult for us but um, we know it's a journey and in a lot of ways when we went out and, and built our list, we always said that the first two years we were going to get the uh, best talent through the door. So it wasn't really position, uh, position specific. It was more so to get the best talent through the door. And, um, and then going forward, we knew that uh, you know, we were going to have to trade you know, a trading situation where, or target specific players for where we, we, we actually required a certain type player. So um, you know, going forward and coming, coming to trade... Uh, the trade period at the end of the year, I think, will be fairly active in terms of um, you know trying to get those players that are, that are going to make us uh, a strong team, and um, you know we're going to be uh, we're going to be very active in that area. So, what sort of players are you now looking for? Look, uh, certainly, it, it, there's areas in our in, in our side that we, we need to get stronger bodies, and um, you know if you do your homework, generally it takes a, a player four to five years to become a a bona, bona fide senior players in terms of body size. So, and a lot of our boys are only their second year of footy. So, we understand we're, we've got to get some strength right across, whether that's midfield, up forward, you know, down back. We, we've got to get some senior bodies through the door, and that and that's what we'll be doing. 
Scotty Clayton, can I ask you about, I guess you would have monitored the Giants closely this year. Have you got any empathy for, for what they've been through this year, year two? It's a difficult year, isn't it? A lot of people talk about the second year blues. Oh, absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's very difficult. The first year, everything you do is for the first time. So your players are so excited. They're in a new hotel. They're on a flight. They're playing against opposition they've never played before. So every experience is new. And then uh, comes the second year. The hotel is <coughs> not looking that good the second year. And the flight's starting to be a pain in the, in, in the backside. And, and, and you get worn out. Um, so, um, and we sort of knew that was going to happen, but we, we underestimated what a, what a big effect. So we, we also were pretty worn out in our second year. And, uh, and of course, um, <coughs> then we launch into our third year, and it's their third pre-season, and, uh, and it starts to click. And, uh, and, and to think that, I mean, this is a bony, bona fide, uh, you know, world-class competition. You, you know, to think that you put in two establishment teams and you can just click your fingers um, would be, you know, you'd be in, in fantasy land. So there's some, there's some hard yards to do, um, and you'll see from our experience that uh, the third year it just starts to, to work and your players are, are creeping towards 50 games, which seems to be that magical number of experience, um, and they're getting a bit, a bit older and more mature and more experiences. And, um, and so I, I don't mean to be good on, re on results because it is a results business, but, but it, it is incidental in the big picture where, 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 where these two teams are going. And, and there's no doubt we're going to be absolute formidable uh, competitors um, in the next few years. I don't think there's anything, any doubt about that whatsoever. But the Gold Coast have set a fairly ambitious target. <coughs> They've said they want to win a premiership in the next three years, I think it is, Scotty. I mean, what, what do you need now to take your list forward? The middle of year three, you've obviously there's been a... A, a big improvement this year, at least, in terms of those results. What do you need now to, to get that premiership? Well, well if we go back, we, we've certainly set really tough targets. And in our sell in the initial time, when, you, when you're out there pitching at players and, you, and, you, and you're wanting a leap of faith and you're selling you know, a dream, uh, we said that, and, I, and from a list manager perspective, I think our job is to, is to get a window of opportunity for your, for your team. Um, and then I think the first thing you do when you get a window of opportunity is try and widen it. Um, um, and like a list management, there's no finishing line. You just, the cycle goes on and on and on. So we set high standards and we're out there selling that we, we think we can get that window um, in, you know, starting to starting sort of the fourth year. And so we won't back away from that. Now, we know that we respect the comp and they're really difficult to, to win, but uh, we, we think we can get in the neighbourhood um, and start to be really... Um, really a dangerous uh, team. And, and I think the other answer to that is um, is we need another 15 games on, on, on our core group. We, 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 we look really methodically and planned at our list and we know the core group of how many games they need to get. We know what a premiership <coughs> team looks like. And, um, and if your core group's playing every week, you know, your game average is going up by one. All of a sudden, you know, we had a game average of 22 games last year. All of a sudden now it's 38 and in eight weeks' time would be 46 and, and we're getting closer. I think like this, uh, the Giants, you've had a few injury issues this year as well. I mean, you've lost some of those tall players, I guess, at crucial times. Smith, um, Lynch also, uh, Charlie Dixon as well. Yep. What, who are the sort of players or what type of players are you looking at for next year? I mean, that would actually finish off that list now. Is it more talls, some midfielders, defenders? No, we're, a mix of players. No, well, look, we're, we're, we're forever uh, trawling the market. We trawl the broader AFL and we know who's out of contract and, um, and so we're flexible to move quickly if we see an opportunity. Um, but we're not hell-bent on just tell the skelter we've got to bring someone in. We're really in a mode of player retention at the moment. We're really, um, we, we certainly wouldn't put any of uh, our core group of, of young elite talent at risk. Um, we're, we're, we're madly... Uh, you know, re-signing and, and recontracting them. And uh, so w w we just think um, our priority is that and 15 games into that core group. And if we have to go specific, we will. Um, but we're not hell-bent on, um, you know, we, we think we've got most bases covered. We've been a bit uh, fortunate that Queensland's produced some tall defenders for us, and they're very hard to find, uh, very, very difficult to find. And we also, as a strategy, uh, we had a... We had a, a, a dearth of ruckmen in our uh, establishment year, and we decided that we'd, we'd take them all um, and use them as currency. Um, so we're, we're, we're good at you know we're good at a couple of positions that are hard to hard to find. Kevin Sheen, as it does it, 
this time every year the talk already starts to turn to the forthcoming NAB AFL draft. You've been monitoring this very closely. Who's likely to be the number one draft pick? Is it Tom Board? Is he a lay down Mazzera? Or is, is there somebody else who may bob up between now and then? Well, certainly, Nick, he's been all the talk and, uh, and no wonder. We have our academy that Mick coaches and they, at the start of the year, get to play against a VFL opposition, so a second tier side. And they played Collingwood on the MCG and these are the best 30 kids in the country of, of draft eligible age. So he plays at centre-half forward, takes 10 marks uh, and looks outstanding. That's a decide that got beaten by 30-odd points. And that was the beginning then of a great run of six to eight games where he, he looked to stand out. But he is playing against under 18 boys. He's a boy of 199 centimetres, so he's six foot six and a bit. He's over 100 kilos. So is it the big boy beating the kids? Uh, but you've got that one point of reference where he did play against Collingwood, the listed players, and was outstanding. Uh, he jumped into the national championships and kicked six goals first game and then goes to Perth. He was looking brilliant. He looked like he'd kicked 15. He'd kicked three in the first eight minutes of the game from three great marks, took a fourth mark and then banged down on the ankle. And off he goes, out for six or eight weeks. So his story couldn't have been more compelling at that stage on the way he'd gone for the year. And that's after really emerging this time last year when he was a bottom age boy that, that kicked four goals playing for the Victorians in a national championship game. <laughs> <clears throat> he is a boy that uh, is, has a great lifestyle. He's a wonderful leader in his group. Um, there doesn't appear to be any faults at this stage, but your one little thing is how they go against the big bodies when Dean Brogan bashes in him or someone like that and really tests him out. That's the only unknown. And that's, I suppose we say the beauty of it all uh, is to how he'll handle the pressure cooker. But he's got all the tools. He ticks all of the boxes. Sounds like a number one draft pick. <laughs> well, I think that uh, the beauty, other clubs will decide that. I think Sharon Berg's a great perform player. If you look at a boy from South Australia, he'll play across half back. He just reads it brilliantly. He's got all of the uh, the leadership about him as well. Sets the play up from back there. Um, so he's one you can compare. There's another boy called Aish, whose uncle, Michael Aish, was a state of origin star for SA. This kid uh, just wins the ball at will. He's, he's the will of the wisp. He gets through the traffic easily and lays it off beautifully. Uh, they're great, pl great young players. A kid called Jack Billings, a left footer in the Nick Del Santo mould. So there's lots of good kids, and there's never that much between them when you look at it. There's never one that's miles ahead of the others, uh, and you know, you've just got to make your choice, and sometimes it can be a bit uh, position-specific as to who you might choose, but I think they're some of the better boys. Well, you've been involved with a lot of these kids as they come through the ranks. I mean, and you've had a chance now, I guess, to have a look also at the Giants and the Suns and their list and their development. I mean, how do you assess them in terms of their development? And also, there's been a lot of talk about whether you would trade the number one draft pick uh, for an experienced player if you're the Giants this year. What's your view on that as well? Well, there'd be big calls to make, but it's, it's uh, you know, the, the great part about it is the clubs are going to make those calls, just as... Uh, the best example of what occurred and what may occur if you do trade is uh, when Essendon decided that the best available player for them back in 1994 was, at that stage, it was a 16-year-old you could take, was a kid called Matthew Lloyd, who'd come through our program, looked an absolute once-in-a-generation player. They gave up four players for him, back to Fremantle, okay, and they got Matthew Lloyd, who uh, a month ago went into the Hall of Fame. Oh. So, you know, there will be some superstars in this draft again. But you might look at your immediate needs and you might get a great deal if you decide to trade. You might get a great deal, an unbelievable deal. You look at the Josh Kennedy back to the West Coast and the Judd deal. Gee, Judd might have a year or two to go. Kennedy might have five more years to go. It might end up a win-win deal there. So uh, I think you've got to look at it in its totality. It could be win-win for both if you trade. So... It's going to be a, a hell of a conversation, I reckon, over the next couple of months and a, a decision for the club to make should it have that number one pick. Schwabby, as Hawthorne coach, you're involved in one of the most famous trades, I guess, in recent history. I think it was back in 2001 when you traded, who was a favourite of the Hawthorne club at that time, Trent Crowe to Frio, along with Luke McFarlane for the number one draft pick that year and Luke Hodge. Ironically, Crowe later ended up back at Hawthorne and played in their 2008 premiership side. Tell us about that trade and what well, your thinking was at the time. Well, it was brilliant, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to talk about myself for a while, but we'll get on to this. Um, uh, can I just mention how we get drafted? In sure. We're having a laugh on the table here. Talent identification spotters come in many shapes and sizes and different people. 
I got picked by a Czechoslovakian phys ed teacher. So I will tell people privately later how that occurred. No, we, we sat around in 2001 and it was a, f and it was a male teacher. <laughs> Glad you said that. Mrs. Hanzalek wasn't bad then. Um, no, we sat around in 2001 and we were going pretty well and um, clearly weren't going to get the first pick. And John Turnbull, who was the recruiting manager at that time, said, uh, we really need to get in early into the draft because there's such a quality of players. And, and the three he was talking in particular were Hodge, Judd and Ball. And you'd finished that year, I think, preliminary finalists? We had. Yeah. But, th but this was early in the year. Mm -hmm. So I said to John, well, you've got to work out a way we can get in into the draft early. So keep monitoring those those guys, and in the end, you've got to have to tell us who's the best out of them, because if you're telling me they're that good, we'll get a deal done. So when we got near the end of the year and we went so well, I was still excited to get the pick because he was so excited about the talent. So I decided that I went through the list as you do, and I and I and the only player I felt we had that was expendable that could possibly get us that pick was Trent Crowe. So. I said to John to start the um, procedure, start talking to Fremantle about doing that trade. So you can never do anything in private. So that conversation got back, Trent cracked the shits, wouldn't take my phone calls, wanted to leave, made it easier. Um, <laughs> it was a good move. <laughs> it wasn't tactical, I didn't do it that way. So, so we, we basically went to Fremantle and said, well, you know, we'll give you um, Trent Crowe if you give us first pick. The complication came when Luke McFarlane, who we, we did not want to let go and was clearly going to be an outstanding player and who we'd taken as a, on spec really, and not play a lot of footy, as a top 10 pick, wanted to go home and was going to go home and walk in the pre-season. So we, they forced us into dealing. So I think in the end we, we, we got pick one and pick 20 and we gave away Crowd and we gave away McFarlane, but we didn't really want to give away McFarlane, but that, he ended up being in it. Pick one worked really well. History has shown pick 20 didn't work that well, but we got other great picks in that draft. So the, the whole debate then came around as who do you take, Hodge, Judd or Ball? We decided to drop Ball off because our view was the other two were better. And I think history showed, and Luke's been a great player, but the other two have shown to be better players. Um, and in the end, John Turnbull had to make the call as recruiting. I said, you, you've told me all year that the number one pick, now you've got to put yourself on the line and you tell us who, who, who we should pick. And he came back and said, take Luke Hodge. So when we called out number one, we took Luke Hodge. And with the benefit of hindsight, I mean, how do you view that deal now? Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a champion. It, it, look, this might be controversial. I, you could argue whether Hodge is better as a player. My view is Hodge is a better captain and a better leader. Not that I know Chris that well, but that's my gut feeling watching it and, and seeing what happens on the field. When you look at the Giants list now, I guess in year two and their development, and facing this question now about whether they would trade a number one draft pick for an experienced player. Tell me who you're going to get. Well, tell me the player you're going to get, and I'll tell you whether you should trade. <laughs> well, I mean, you know the AFL as well as anyone. I mean. When you look out there, I mean, in, and you look at the Giants' list and what they need, I guess, would you look at it? Absolutely. But I want to know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> do it if you can, yeah. Absolutely. If you get Franklin, I'd do it. Well, Mickey, oh, you've, um, you've seen a lot of these kids coming through the ranks. Tom Boyd, John Patton, Jeremy Cameron. We talk about all these kids, I guess, at the Giants. I mean, how do you rate Boyd? Sorry, who, who, right. Tom Boyd. Oh, look, he's been fantastic. I think Kev's covered it off pretty much. Um, he's a ripper. Um, he ticks all the boxes, as Kevin said. Um, certainly one of those big body players that you need to go. You can build a team around. Um, you, know, you can go on the ruck, go forward, kick goals. And I think he's, um, he's an outstanding individual. Uh, one of those guys that you'd love to have around your footy club. Schwabby mentioned Buddy Franklin. There's been a lot, of, a lot of talk and speculation about Buddy. You spent your career playing here in Sydney and you played with some of the great players in Tony Lockett and Barry Hall, those big full forwards who put bums on seats. They're excitement machines. Um, I mean, are they the type of player you need in a place like Sydney? They help. 
Um, look, uh, I was really lucky to come at, uh, I guess, a, a stage in Sydney's um, development with Plugger, Paul Roos is in that same, um, that same trade. And we were just sort of tagging along as, as young kids do. And um, to see what Plugger was uh, to be able to do in Sydney was, was unbelievable. And, you know, I remember going out to Blacktown doing, doing footy clinics, um, you know, doing side and, and whatnot and going out there and, and kids would go, you know, who the hell are you? And what's this stupid game you're trying to teach us? Um, and it was, it was interesting. We so were just trying to show you the handball and kick and, you know, teach you about AFL. And they didn't want to know about it. They're all rugby fans and, um, you know, where, and the first question was, who are you? And uh, where the hell's Tony Lockett? So they knew who Plugger was. Um, and it was, just, it, was, it was unbelievable. And that was my first couple of months in Sydney. They all knew who Plugger was. They didn't know what he looked like, but they just wanted to know him. But then I've described what, he, what, he's, what he's done and what he means to the footy club. And, you know, hopefully he's going to change the fortunes of the Sydney Swans. And um, um, you know, those players are very, very rare. And, and you mentioned Barry Hall. Barry was in the same sort of mould. Um, Love the Sydney lifestyle as as the plugger because they are just left to their own and you know go out and play and, and promote the game and not too many people bother them. I guess it, I mean being in Melbourne, Sosson and you were the biggest star in Melbourne. Walking around, you tell me, um, uh, <laughs> like you can't walk down Ligon Street without any, everybody you know, asking him to sit down and have a coffee. So the same thing here. Um, so what impact could Buddy have on and off the field? Oh, it'd be time? huge, be tremendous. I think I think I agree with Pat. If you can get him. Get him. Um, an unbelievable player. We all know that. Um, again, everybody in Australia know who's, who Buddy Franklin is. Tell us a little bit about your role for those people <coughs> who, who don't know much about what you do at the AOS AFL Academy, your coaching role there. Yeah, so coaching the, the best talent, uh, the under-18 team. It's been one of those dream jobs, I guess. Um, you know, Mentoring these guys coming through the system and they're going to be future stars of our game. Um, and history tells us that with all of the, the intakes we've had Previously, so um, my job, along with a, with a fantastic staff, uh, Matthew Lloyd's on the coaching panel, uh, uh, Ty Canelli, Brad Ottens, uh, Glenn Jakovic, Brad Johnson, so some unbelievable names there um, to we be saw able Anthony to. Anthony Kudafidi's up here. This and week, I mean, Kuda, Kuda yeah. coaching the world team, um, doing a great job there. So an unbelievable staff and teaching, I guess, the knowledge and experience and what's required to play at the elite level. Um, that's 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 the role. Um, you know, we take the kids into the camps, we teach them everything that we know, and, and then some. We have Kev and, and Schwabby. Um, we invite all the recruiters to come in and, and I guess meet the kids and really assess uh, if they're the player for their club. Um, the doors always open. Those guys come in and, and get to make that. I guess when it comes to draft time, to make that real crucial decision to who they're going to draft. Um, look, we, and one of the I guess one of the perks is we get to go overseas and promote the game. Utilise the best facilities overseas. This year was um, Italy, London, um, Denmark. So um, it was either there or Newcastle. Um, so I think <laughs> it wasn't much of a choice. I think, really. I think we made the right choice, Robbie. Yeah, right. um, so Italy, London, Denmark to promote the game and, and do what we do over there. I just think it's an unbelievable opportunity for these guys to travel overseas. Um, as a coaching staff, we crack the whip a bit, uh, get them out of their comfort zone. The recruiters come; um, they get to sort of sit. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner on the bus, on the train, on the planes, and, and really sort of get to know these kids inside and out. Has it made you think any more about perhaps coaching <laughs> AFL ranks one day and a senior oh, coaching role? At, at this stage, I'm really comfortable with the, the gig I've got at the moment. Um, I just think it's, as I said, and I've always said this, uh, it's the best job in the world. You're looking after the best under 18 talent in Australia, and um, to have a little bit to do with uh, their development and going on to bigger and better things. I mean, Steve's sitting here, it's great to see Steve. Um, um, here today, but he was one of the standouts um, for, for me as a, as a coach and really pleased to see how he's gone on to, to his career here at GWS. And um, I just, I mean, one of the things, I guess, with GWS, nearly half their list of guys who have come through our through our program. So I, I'm, I'm a massive rap, um, obviously, for the program, but also with what GWS are doing. And I just think uh, in the next couple of years, they're, they're going to be a really tough side to beat. Schwabi, just tell us a little bit about your role as director of coaching at the AFL because it's working closely with guys like Mick and the other coaches as well, isn't it? Am I on here? Or? Hello? I think you're on. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. My, my title's director of coaching. It covers the talent area as well for coaches who are in that, in that area. So Mick, Mick runs the AOS and we've got other academies right around the country who uh, I try and help 
when it, whenever I possibly can. Um, got a great love of coaching. Uh, we run high level coaching courses for, for the system. So um, the level three high performance course runs in uh, the same week as the combine and uh, that's for the AFL clubs and certainly for state league. Because um, what we've got to realise in this business is that people aspire not just to play, but people aspire to coach. People aspire to be a, a, a sports scientist or they aspire to be an administrator. So we've got to have pathways all the way through. The other beauty of coaching is this, that fundamentally the game's environment at local level is determined, I believe, to a large extent by the coach. So if we can educate the coaches better and have them sending great messages out, we create a far greater environment for people who want to get involved in. And that's been shown, that, that we lead the way very much in creating... And, and we're not perfect... We're not perfect, but we... Can you all hear me anyway? Yeah. We're not perfect and we... Have... Oh, sorry. God, don't tell me you're going to record me. <laughs> Can I scrub some of the stuff? <laughs> it's only going live on the Giants' website. Is that all right? Yep. Yeah, no, no. Fa- look, I'm just a great believer that coach education is all about helping this game as much as, as anything else. And uh, i got great faith in uh, what, what we do as an organisation and... Um, Great coaches make good environments, but really good coaches help players get better quickly. So, and you're seeing some senior potential senior coaches coming through the ranks. I think they're all always uh, potential senior coaches, but the the big dilemma now, as we've seen with the Melbourne Football Club, is they've they've taken untried coaches, and they've whether they were to blame or not for the performance. But when they don't succeed, then a club is then very reluctant to to go to an untried coach. So. I think there's a, a good market also for, for people to consider in this industry that people who have had a lot of experience are still got a lot to offer. And we cut coaches off very, very quickly. And you've got one of the all-time great coaches in Kevin Sheedy who's survived, you know, I shouldn't say survive, but he's deserved to survive and, and flourish. But Sheeds and Malthouse and those guys, they're very rare. Um, so I think it's a combination, Nick. I think I think sometimes a club needs an experienced coach. Sometimes I think it can afford to take a younger coach, a gamble on a younger coach. Depends so, where they're at. So you raised Melbourne there. I mean, <coughs> if you're in Melbourne shoes, looking for a senior coach, I mean, what are the things they've got to weigh up, and and how would you approach it? You know, you know, the the thing we all always assume is that the clubs in the who's got the whip hand. You want to you want a senior coach with a lot of experience. He wants to know what you're doing about your footy club too. He wants to know that you've got a good footy club, that you've got a strong board, that you've got a good administration. You know, so if you're going to the market and you're going to ask someone like Paul Roos to coach your footy club, you better be sure that you've got a good footy club for him to coach. Otherwise, he's not going to go near you. Young coaches will take a risk and they'll go into an environment and sometimes get slaughtered because the environment they go into is no good for them. There's no support. So it's a really difficult question to answer. But what, what are you looking for in a coach, you know? I think you've got to, someone who's got a vision. Someone who's going to say, this is where we're going to go and this is how we're going to get there. Clearly, they've got to have some charisma and, and, and excite people and people want to get involved. And, they got, and underneath that, they've got to have the fundamentals of knowledge and that. But they, they also need to be great man managers and, and managers of people because if they haven't got that skill in any business, but if they haven't got that skill as a head coach, they, they won't last. Is it the toughest job in footy, being a senior coach? Well, it's the toughest job I've done, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Scotty, I wanted to ask you about Jager O'Meara and Jack Martin, two players you've now got on your list. One we've seen this year obviously make his debut in O'Meara and just I think everyone's been blown away by how he's, how he's um, gone about it. We'll see Jack Martin next year. There's been a lot of talk about how clubs, particularly those in Melbourne, were prepared to to trade to get their hands on those two kids. Do you think that was a missed opportunity for them? I mean, obviously, you've been the beneficiary of it. Uh, no question. Uh, I, I, I totally uh, think that uh, the market missed the boat. Uh, thank goodness for us. Um, and, and, and the Giants did extremely well out of the mini draft. I mean, produced seven first round draft picks. That's going to get us all, you know, there's a lead time to all this. And, um, and, and certainly uh, uh, established clubs' uh, inability to, uh, to, to reach out to the market. Um, I reckon was really poor uh, strategic uh, move, and uh, and and after that we had the we had the best deal um, in both cases. So uh, we're very pleased. They are two very exciting um, 
the players, no doubt. So I think, um, and it's just going to be really interesting to see whether um, they try and react now to um, the first round draft pick and and um, and be more realistic. Um, but if I were you guys, I'd be I'd be very very careful in trading a first round draft pick. You can't. Um, you're not going to be on the bottom for long. It might be the last one. So, uh, and I can't think of too many that actually won. I can't think of one example where someone's traded a really early pick and they've actually won. They've bought in something that exceeded what turned out. I mean, clearly Hawthorne smashed that deal. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd be, and every, every decision, there's an implication. And, and we know we've only got a finite amount of money and a finite amount of draft picks, and so uh, they're our lifeline draft picks. They, uh, it's, it's just there's a lead time, so you've got to understand that they are absolutely vital. I'm sure Stephen Silvani's yeah. listening intently. Sos, <laughs> your view on O'Meara and, and Mark, I mean, how concerted was your to try to get experienced players through the door in exchange for those, for those two players in particular? And do you think clubs, particularly those in Melbourne, just underestimated the value of those kids? Um, well, we, we knew they were going to be stars of the game. <coughs> Clearly, um, Scotty valued them. We valued them. Um, to the point where we actually tried to get O'Meara back, um, with a bit of backroom stuff going on, we got gazumped, but that's okay. But uh, we tried our best, and we really did try our best to, to, to keep Jager. But, um, um, you know, Scotty did wonderfully well, and, and I think in the long run we did pretty well as well in terms of being able to get some, some really early draft picks through the door. So, and, and I guess that just leading on to the, from that question was that first pick, um, you know, it's certainly out there, but you've got to give something good up, and because potentially what it could be is a Jager O'Meara, and I'm happy to put our first pick on the table for Jager today. How many clubs have called you in the last? <laughs> <laughs> it's a live trade, I think. It's a live trade. Um, how many clubs have called you, Sos, about the number one draft pick? Oh, look, certainly. I mean, we're dealing with hypotheticals at the minute. I mean, we certainly haven't secured it. Um, and we'd like to win games in this uh, latter part of the, the season. So, um, but there have, there have been, um, you know, obviously a couple of clubs ringing up to say, listen, we'd like to sort of chat. But it's a bit early at the minute to, to, to really have a serious chat about it. Two other players I want to talk about before we finish up and we open up for questions from the floor. Carmichael Hunt and Israel Folau. And obviously, um, Scotty, you're very familiar with Carmichael Hunt's development. But just going back a step or two, tell us about how he was recruited in the first instance. Uh, it's as much fun as I've had in footy, I reckon, um, uh, with, with Carmichael Hunt. We, we, we had Queensland as a zone, um, uh, but more than that, Coming from another sport, you can just put them on your list as, a, as, a, as an international player, basically. And uh, I was talking to Mark Browning on the phone, who um, who is AFL Queensland talent development manager, um, and he was reading the the, uh, the Courier Mail, and he's saying they're saying here that Carmichael Hunt is going to swap codes. And, oh, really? And he was known to us. We'd seen him at uh, at Brisbane Boys College. Um, like eight years prior, uh, and he played a couple of games of footy um, in the off-season. We went, wow, what is this kid? And uh, they said, oh, don't worry. He was 14 at the time. They said he signed with the Broncos. So we didn't have a vehicle to get him back in those days. So when he was talking about uh, uh, swapping codes, we thought, uh, well, what about our code? We're, we're a code, aren't we? What about us? So uh, I rang his manager, uh, David Riolo, from Titan Management here, who uh, refused to take my calls for about... Uh, two weeks, but twice a day he finally sort of thought, I've got to get this bloke to go away. And I said, Carmichael Hunt, I mean, AFL, the, all the ducks will line up, you're a new franchise, and he wants to stay in Queensland. And uh, so we went from there. I rang David Matthews at the time, who, who was at the AFL, and Operation uh, um, Hunt went into, went into play, the Kona Silent. And uh, for six months, um, we, uh, we wooed him and uh, we had meetings and we finally sort of convinced him that he could play. Uh, we had secret kicking sessions with uh, Kevin Sheehan, myself and Nathan Buckley. Tell us about uh, those, particularly the one with Nathan Buckley. Well, it was one Saturday morning and I think he played the Friday night. They played West Tigers uh, here um, on the Friday night. 
Uh, it was really cold. We picked him up. He got the first flight out of uh, Sydney the next morning, came to Melbourne. Um, picked him up at the airport. He had a pair of jeans and thongs on. It was about minus two. We drove him to this little uh, oval uh, in um, off Sydney Road, basically at, at, in Carlton, Princess Park, and we got the footy out. And Jason McCartney was also there, who was working for the AFL at the time. And uh, we got him to put on a pair of uh, runners out of the back of the car. And his girlfriend and our wife was there. And uh, he had one kick, and Kevin looked at me and he was almost cheering like what about that it went about 40 meters that high he could just kick it and so we just said let's let's get back in the car that's that's all over (laughs) deal was done deal was done and so uh it it was an intriguing um it was an intriguing time um so we uh we we finally um uh, did a deal uh with david matthew being a, a huge player in all that and then, uh, and then the AFL juggernaut took over, and the media department uh, were magnificent um, in in regards to preparing for the announcement and and all those all those things. So there were a couple of key times during it. I remember David Rowell at one stage said, and we 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 we're so close to signing, but he said I, I need to give um, the NRL the uh, option to to do something about this. So he said I'm going to gallop to say. Um, this player has a chance to, to, to leave. Uh, you're prepared to invest anything to keep him. And I think a key, a, the key thing that David and I were, uh, did in that was we convinced Friolo to not say it was AFL. He said, we, we've been up front and, and, and really in, in good faith. Now, in good faith, when you say to Gallup, uh, what are you prepared to invest to keep him? Um, he may change codes. Do not mention that it's AFL. Will you give us that guarantee? I think that was a pivotal moment uh, too, because who knows what would have happened uh, if, if if they had a known we were the we were the enemy at that stage. And how have you seen his development? Obviously, year three this year, he's had a few injuries, I know, but I mean, have you been happy with the way he's he's tracked? Oh, he's been extraordinary. He he, we're talking about. Um, Establishment clubs bringing in uh, uncontracted and older players, it's really difficult because often they come for the wrong reasons and they end up being your leaders. Um, and so we've got to, you know, our leadership, we've got to wait for our, for the Stephen Canignos to come through and lead and, and lead us. And, and, and he, um, he came for all the right reasons. Um, he wanted, he's a Queenslander and his, um, his leadership as being a professional sportsman has been extraordinary to us. He's just the, he's just the most, he's got the perfect uh, mental um, ability to play competitive sport. Uh, he has had a few injuries this year, but he's, he's, he was terrific last year and his first few games this year were really good. Had a bit of a niggling leg injury, so we've just got to get him over that and he'll relaunch again. Which brings me to Izzy Falau. Kevin Sheen, I wanted to ask you about Izzy. I mean, we've seen what he's done this year, making the switch to... To union, and I think everyone would agree, league or union or AFL, what impact the AFL experience had has had on him as an athlete, a very positive one. Were you disappointed when he made the decision to leave at the end of last year? Was it was it a question of just probably is he maybe not having the patience? I'd have to agree with that. I'd heard uh, Kevin Sheedy make that comment a couple of times, but uh, I'd felt that just about the last game he played was nearly his best. I think he's on the verge of it. But at the end of it, you need to have the passion for the game because it is hard to become a very good regular player and maybe he just lacked that. But as an athlete, he had all of the, all of the things that we talked about earlier. He was, he was the one capable of making some amazing plays in our game with his natural spring, etc. Uh, I'll never forget again the, the corresponding little cert session, combine if you like, Holmesy, that we had uh, in Castle Hill with, with Izzy. Um, we're inspired a bit by... Paul Tiagliabu, who was the former boss of the NFL, uh, sorry, the NFL in the States, come across at an industry conference and said what he thought of our game was exceptional athletes making exceptional plays. That's who you are. That's an outsider looking in at us. And so that's what we're after. We're after the best. And so Izzy was the best we felt in, in RL. We had the Carmichael experience. And what is lost on all of this, the club was still about 18 months away from joining the AFL. There was a window there where you had to tell people you existed. And you needed someone to come in to actually say the Giants had been born. And so we got an unbelievable run for 18 months of publicity without having a kick in anger. I think the first week 
It generated nearly 10 million in publicity. Unbelievable publicity for the brand new club. And people were able to, to, to watch the, the dream of the birth of the club unfold over that period of time before he had a kick in anger. But we truly believed he had the tools to do it. And like we said earlier, that you can't compare anything to AFL. And not everyone will succeed. But I still think he could have got there. And I probably watched nearly every kick he had or taped it and then watched it again. So there's enough indicators for a, a guy in a handful of games to say, well, gee, he can get there. Well, it's a question, I guess, to throw into the panel then. I mean, would you continue to look at players like Falau and other players from other codes? I mean, we're all battling for talent with other sports. Would you continue to look at other players in league or union or other sports? I think the one we're really at, the ones we're mainly after within Australia are the ones at 16 or 17 that could make the choice and go either way. That could play the cricket, the rugby, the basketball. You really want to compete at that space, but you'd never say never to a slightly older one. But the uniqueness of these two was that 18 month gap where they become the face of the club for a while when you need to have a face or two of the club. Uh, with our established clubs, they'd need to perform pretty well straight away as a 22 year old. That's hard to do. But we are taking Americans and, and are prepared to wait for three or four years. We're taking Canadians back to Mike Pike. We're prepared to wait. So it uh, depends on the circumstances. You wouldn't say never. OK, I think that's enough questions from me. We did want to open it up to the floor, though, for some questions. And I think Tiff's got a, Tiffany Woz has got a, a microphone at the back and also over this side as well. Um, if you'd like to ask a question of any of our panellists, and I might get you to firstly introduce yourselves and say name and ask who you'd like to direct your question to. There's a couple of mics doing the rounds, so question over here. Hi, uh, my name's Justin Nelson. Um, I don't know who'd like to answer the question. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, developing players to introduce them to the game. Like uh, there was numbers like a thousand players nominate and a hundred get picked, and there's this big drive of 16-year-olds when they start um, showing some talent where they concentrate purely nearly on football and other development in their like schooling and things like that become secondary and they think I'm going to be drafted they have a confidence in that it's this um, the question is about the support because the club or the development program becomes such a powerful force in their lives and I know just the like the Americans have the program where you don't get certain grades then you can't go on is there any I haven't heard anything about that today and I'm just wondering if someone would like to answer that about yeah. Our academies say developing better people, better players. And we, and we do stick true to that. I mean, we, we understand the importance of schooling for all those highly talented guys. And um, the, the hard thing for schooling becomes after they get drafted. But prior to that, you know, we advocate that they've got to stick to that if, it, if, it's, if it's their passion as well, because so some kids are really passionate about other aspects of their life. I think the community becomes super important to them still. You know, we, we don't want them to disconnect from their family and friends, and we don't want them to disconnect from even their, you know, their local footy club for, until the point where they do move on. So I'd like to think that we, uh, we still take those things into consideration. Because you're right, it's it's almost an impossible dream when you when you start looking at the figures. A lot of a lot of boys from a, a young age will aspire to be AFL footballers, and that dream might end at 13 or 14 when they probably realise. What we hope is we, that the the dream might end to get drafted, but the dream to keep playing AFL football doesn't. And most of us in this room, and I look around, all my mates and my you know love football. I go down and watch local footy, and I'm just I love their passion and they still want to play the game and be involved. Once we lose that, I think we lose a big part of what AFL footy is about. And, and I don't see that in American sport. I, I only see elite sport and nothing else. And I think if we ever got to that stage, then we're poorer for it. The, um, it's, a, it's a good point. I, I, uh, the, the, the dream of, of young people, it is, it's so powerful. Uh, the, the manager of the Sandingham Dragons was telling me um, only last week that he had a squad of... Uh, Fifteen-year-olds, uh, you know, there's forty kids on the floor, and 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 he and he spells out to them that you know the fact that the numbers say that out of you forty, I mean, the only possible, you know, there may be two at most of you that can actually get drafted, and he said that to every every young boy to, uh, to an individual, 
they're sitting there thinking the same thing. They're looking around the room thinking, I wonder who the other one is. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, uh, you don't want to extinguish that, but uh, that's the reality of it all. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, over here, uh, Neil Cordy. Yeah, question for Soss. Uh, just given what Scott was saying earlier about uh, warning about giving away a, a number one draft pick and putting on the table, do, are you worried that you could give away a, a Chris Judd or a um, Luke Hodge or it, by putting that um, that tray, that pick on the table? You're always worried about giving away an early pick and you've got to do your homework. So, I mean, it gets back to preparation and, and that's why those picks are so valuable. So... Um, it's been mentioned here today that, you know, if we if that pick is on the table, we certainly want something very good for it. So we'll we'll look at everything. We'll look at every deal if that's if that's the case. But certainly, it's going to have to stack up. Just a question for Scott: um, Do you think you had a, an advantage in going first ahead of uh, ahead of the Giants in terms of going to the market and getting players like? Uh, Gary Ablett and, and the, the guys that were in their prime, do you think that, or was it more difficult going first? Um, yeah, that's a really good point. I, look, we certainly, uh, from, from getting uncontracted players, I think perhaps we did have an advantage, but that they were never going to be a massive part of our list build. There, there was always only going to be, you know, six to eight, um, because um, we had to give... Uh, our drafted young players experience an opportunity and this, this generation demanded that. So I think we had an advantage in the fact that, yes, um, we, uh, we, we, we were first off with the uncontracteds. Um, our list build's been so methodical and planned um, and we've stuck to our guns and I think perhaps GWS following, the Giants following us in that part uh, to see that's probably helped. Yep. Um, so, and look, we, we've got a great affinity. The two establishment clubs at the moment, we've got a great af affinity and synergy, and, and, uh, but it won't be too long before we, uh, we start just ripping into each other big time. I think that's already happening, Scott. <laughs> Next question. Uh, Soss, uh, Andrew Wu uh, speaking here. Um, just a question on the number one draft pick and, and Lance Franklin. A lot of the conversation has been to get Buddy through uh, free agency. Is there a chance that you could use number one to get Buddy over the line, or or is that just something that would be through free agency? Look, just on the Buddy thing, um, you know, it's, obviously he's one of many players that we're talking about in to, to, to two managers. Um, you know, there are a number of players that are out of contract. There's still a number of players that are who are going to be free agents. So. Um, yeah, we're, we're talking to his management group, but having said that, there's no he hasn't made a decision. He doesn't want to talk to us in terms of um, making a decision. So that's where that sort of sits at the moment. Um, to, to answer your question, anything's possible. Um, it might be free agency. Um, if he does decide to become that free agent, or it might be a trade situation, we just don't know. It's, uh, I guess it's too early in, in the season to be able to, to give you the right answer. We have another question. Uh, Justin Detheridge, uh, question for Soss. Soss, um, a couple of questions asking you to look forward. I'd ask you to look back a couple of years in. What would you do differently? Oh, good question. Um, what would I do differently? Um, look, I think, um, I think in time, in, in, in a, one or two years, I'd probably... Um, look back and say it'll be a lot easier to answer because there's obviously there's going to be some mistakes that we've sort of made along the way but sort of at the minute we're two years in and or really a year and a half in so you've got to give some some time for I guess picks or or the uncontracted as we got through the door to really you know to, to really kick in so um, you know in terms of our list I would have loved to have been you know probably been where Scotty was quite um, fortunate in terms of Having a number of ruckmen on their list, you know, there, there's certain areas on our list that we, we're certainly short in, and, and that was an area that probably would have been quite public in saying that, geez, I would have loved another one or two ruckmen on our list. I think that's really important. It's important going forward. So, and we've got rookie spots to be able to do that. So, that's probably the one area that I'd say, you know, I would have loved to have have a couple more ruckmen on the list, but. I'm sure in two years' time there'll be other things that come up that you know I probably overlooked 
you know. But at the minute, we're one and a half years in a way of build, so it's a bit early to, to really pinpoint it. In, the interesting thing is we're both reliant on one draft pool, both Elkos and GWS, and those draft pools, they are, they are what they are. Um, and there's never a draft pool where all 52 cards of the pack's there. There's never, you know, there's not four aces, four kings, and it's not every, <laughs> the whole lot's not there. So we, we both knew that some of the currency that we took in that initial period in, in, our, in our draft pool, that would have to spread our age from that. But you can't do that in the first 12 months because you don't know enough about yourself. So the point is that there's a lead time to all this. So we both have known and we, we talk about these things that you've got to end up reallocating some of that currency you got from your first draft pool to spread your age and to get the 52 cards in the pack. But that's, that's, that's nearly at year two because then you start to, you've had enough time to play the players enough and to work out who your core group is and, and start knowing more about yourself. So it's just a bit early for you guys. We're, mm. I mean, we're 12 months in front, so we're a bit of a step in front in regards to that. We have another question from the front here. Yeah, Glenn Morgan uh, for Stephen. Sorry again to harp on the number one draft pick, but it's got us all intrigued, I think. It was just if um, Scott said Gold Coast's premiership window sort of opens up three or four years down the track, then presumably yours opens up four or five or, or beyond. So if you swap that draft pick for an established player, that established player is not really going to be in their prime and possibly even finished by the time you're having a crack at that premiership window. Uh, so are there other reasons for making that number one draft pick and how important is that in your consideration? For example, keeping the morale up of the other boys or teaching the other boys or even getting bumps on seats? Yeah, well, there's, there's all that. Um, you probably answered your own questions in a lot of ways, but so, look, we certainly understand that, um, I think I mentioned before in my answer, that we need to get some, some um, stronger bodies into our team. I think our, our group's done it tough. Um, and some of that's been probably due to some injuries that we've had along the way in terms of our senior player and even our couple of our younger players that had some size about them. So they're doing it quite tough at the minute in, in a lot of ways. You know, as a list manager, I'm really proud to see what they're actually doing because I often t I speak to other clubs and they and they they um, you know they often often give praise in terms of what the great the group's been able to do. They're 20 year old boys or 20 20 year old. Uh, young men, and, and they're coming up against seasoned, seasoned athletes, and it's a brutal game. Uh, it's a brutal game, but it generally takes four to five years for them to get AFL bodies, and and that's what it is. And that's we go back to that point of that premiership window. It generally takes four or five five years for them to become physical enough to be able to sustain it over four quarters. The pressures of what AFL football brings on and off the field, um, maturity. All that sort of evolves in that four or five year period. So, um, you know, yes, we need some strong bodies. Um, that number one draft pick, it's a big decision. But if we get a super, super deal, we're going to look at it. But if we don't, we're quite happy to keep it. I did want to bring up a couple of our players, Taylor Adams and Stephen Cornelio, for a chat before we finish up, but we still have time for a couple more questions before we do that. Just a quick one for, uh, for Shifter about how, um, how the development of these kids has changed over the years. When I was coming through the system 15, 20 years ago, you were obviously still um, you know, back then in charge. An interesting question for Mickey O as well. I was coached by a, a fellow by the name of Slug Jordan, who was um, you know, at Sandringham Dragons in the 18s, who was then regarded as one of the great junior coaches of all time. But his MO, I mean, he had no issue with dragging me and others up in front of the group and really, you know, giving you an absolute mother of all sprays. You know, your weak as piss, your private school poofter, all this sort of stuff. So, <laughs> you know, he was fairly close to the mark in some, in some instances. <laughs> But it, I, I question whether there's room in the game for slug anymore and whether there's room for, for the spray or do you have to look after these kids in, in cotton wool because they're all, you know, in, the, in their sort of formative years of their life and you don't want to break them. I mean, slug broke as many as he, as he made when I was coming through those years, but that was the way he went about it and it worked then. Well, those were the days, of, you know, the Ron Barassis and we go back to the, the Alan Killigrews and the, and the preachers of the game and that's, that's across all world sport through the 70s and the 80s, but... That's long gone now. I think the positive psychology approach is the best way to go. I think most of the corrective stuff is done privately rather than in the group. Uh, you'd get a boy aside to talk about his development needs rather than his weaknesses. <coughs> That's all in the way in which you pitch it all. Uh, yes, and they are fairly sensitive to all of that. So I think that our modern-day coaches at the development level 
uh, a great modern day teachers. And so do you think from what you've seen, do you think that is it's just times have changed, or do you think it genuinely is a better approach, or do you think more kids are making it now because they don't perhaps get broken when they're sixteen and say, "Oh, this is too hard. I'm, you know, this bloke's just destroyed me." I'd be at one bad game. Yeah, at a guess, Gus, I'd suggest that yeah, some were broken by that approach. They couldn't cope. Uh, were probably forced out of out of all sports at at different times from making it to the elite level because they, they weren't personally looked after and cared for. They're treated the same, and they're not the same. Kids are all different. Yes, I reckon where, where footy's changed a lot, I mean, and that's where the professional side has sort of come into it. Um, our development programs, not in junior, the junior side of things, but also senior clubs, is that, yes, the sprays are still there, but not quite as frequent. But it's become solution-based. It's not being berated anymore. I think most clubs and good coaches now can tell a guy, OK, you're doing this wrong, but he gives them the solution. And that's, that's one area, I think, you know, our game's gone forward in. Schwabby, do you have a view on that? I mean, as a, somebody who's coached and obviously been coached by some of the greats, Alan Jeans and the like. I was going to ask you, Gus, does that work in the corporate world? Well, it was interesting because I was just thinking from everyone in the group here. I mean, they've all got, I'm sure, people in their teams who are aged, you know, 21 through to, through to 30 who um, have to be managed very differently. I don't know, for me, I, I, I was brought up, you know, with with a mum who just wanted to wrap me in cotton wool, and dad was never a really hard taskmaster like that. So if I didn't have that, I, I, I really, I actually quite responded to it quite well. But, but you've turned out fine. I, well, you know, some of that. But another, I mean, I remember, you know, it, it, when Slug one day took, you know, Justin Murphy, who went number three, great player for for, for Carlton and Essendon. I mean, he took him into a cubicle and said, "You want to go? Let's go!" And threw and just about threw a punch at him and thought, "I think, you know, this is." And, and then Murphy said, what are you fucking doing? And just walked out. And there were other kids who walked out. And, and I'm sure that if any of us in our corporate careers did that, well, we'd be straight into HR and you'd probably be out the yeah, door. Yeah. So so the, you can't do it. You just can't do it anymore. It's probably the same answer then. Can't do it. Um, yeah. But it, I, I don't, it doesn't mean I, that... It doesn't work. But it doesn't mean that there isn't necessarily a place for it for no, certain no, no. individuals well, who potentially could respond for, to it. For, for honesty... And uh, it's just a matter of how you deliver it and where you deliver it and what manner you deliver it in. And we're all individuals and smart people realise what's the best way to get a result from someone. Do we, we have time for one more question, I think. Up the front here. Um, Kev, a question for you. I would, I would think in your job one of the really difficult things is you see all these kids, and Mickey probably for you as well, um, but there's this flash date sometime in October, November, where they either get drafted or they don't get drafted. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would have thought that one of the great things about footy is recently we've seen these mature age rookies, the Barlows, mm. mm. the Dorcos and so forth. What's the AFL doing about the pathway for those kids that don't get drafted so they've still got an opportunity? Is the mm. AFL getting more involved in that or do they just leave that to sort of club footy? Yeah, it's a good question. So on draft night, there'll be about 100 taken. 80 will be the kids. 20 will get the recognition. Michael Barlows of the world will be the upgraded rookie. So every year, 20% roughly are the one that's probably done it tough through a state league somewhere, and that's, that's when they get their recognition. They might have already played by then, but that's the way our system works. They are upgraded onto the main list. And so they've normally emerged from the state leagues down south, which had been the VFL, the, the Sandful, the Waffle. But we've worked hard now for the last three years to build the Northeast AFL. They that had a lot to do with that in its, its original forms. And even this week, we've been to further meetings about the, the look of that going forward. And Craig's been involved as well, Craig Bolton, in his role. So there's a major focus on making sure we've got a powerful, super attractive league for the boys that don't initially get called out on draft night, that what they want to go as a 19-year-old, pursue the North East AFL in whatever conference it is, and bob up, um, uh, you know, as a 20, 21 or 22-year-old and have their day on draft day uh, and, and have their name called out. So that's most important to us because not everyone's ready at 18 years of age, far from it. Before I ask the boys to come up and join us, I wanted to ask Mickey O'Loughlin a question as well. I mean, and excuse my bias here, but obviously <coughs> it's, a, um, it's a Giants flavoured question. Of all the kids that you've seen on our list now that you've coached, who's the best of them, do you think? Oh, they're all great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I, I just think um, the way that the, the guys have adapted to coming in and playing uh, at the elite level, still small bodies, Playing against men um, has been terrific. So um, I didn't play favourites, but Steve's one of those one of those guys that I really enjoyed being a, a part of his development. Um, Lockie Whitfield's another one from last year. So 
Um, Jeremy Cameron. Jeremy, well, we what a player he's, he's turning into. So, um, and there there are others at other clubs, but um, for me, it's just always been about um, they're all treated equally. Um, it's like any footy club; you get along with some, and some that you've got to put a bit more time into. But um, you make just for me, it's all about passing on the knowledge that I've learnt over 16 years of footy, um, the coaches I've been involved with, um, the great players. I mean, Craig Bolton's here, one of the great leaders at the Swans back in his day, and, and you, you can pick bits and pieces up from, from a lot of them. So, I mean, my coach is Ron Barassi, um, Rodney Ede, and uh, Paul Roos. So some, some fantastic coaches and, and people I've learnt off, and I've got to know Schwabi and, and Kev a, a fair bit with the role and, and taking bits and pieces from what they've been able to teach me as well. And... Um, and trying to put that into your own special little brand and, and teach these guys, um, you know, how to play this, how to play the game. Well, just on that, it's probably a good time now to introduce two of our young players. As I mentioned before, Taylor Adams and Stephen Keneally are two young guys who are already making their marks at AFL level with the Giants. Would you please welcome the guys up to stage, Steve and Taylor? <coughs> Guys, um, we've got the big game obviously this weekend against the Swans at the SCG, the reverse derby. Unfortunately, both you guys won't be playing. Steve, you've copped a bit of a hamstring injury and Taylor, you've copped a suspension after Adam Cooney copped one from you. Take yeah. us through it. He's on. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm uh, sitting out this week uh, having a rest, uh, which isn't ideal, but um, just had a bit of a brain fade uh, playing the dogs on the weekend. Um, and I uh, yeah, couldn't get under my skin and uh, I retaliated in a, in, a, in a pretty poor way and a bit disappointed with, uh, with my actions. But um, I'll cop it and uh, move on, uh, hopefully get, get right and play the, uh, the Dons at Skoda Stadium the week after. Just on the game on the weekend, obviously... Disappointing to go down by such a narrow margin. I mean, we had our chances to win the game, didn't we? Yeah, it was. Um, it's probably one of our better games for the year. Um, and obviously, being really in the game at, at three-quarter time, it was disappointing to uh, end up losing. But, um, you know, we, we take positives out of it and um, we reviewed it during the week. Um, and hopefully, we, we can go out and play well against the Swans this week. Steve, you copped a little bit of a hammy two or three weeks, perhaps, at this stage? Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping so. So um, I'll start, I'm actually doing a little bit of jogging tomorrow and it's just one of them unfortunate things. It's one of the, the fixtures we really look forward to, um, especially at the SDG where a lot of us wouldn't have you know, played. We've been there a couple of times, but, um, yeah, it's unfortunate. But, yeah, I'll hopefully uh, be back in two or three weeks' time. Tell us about life at the Giants in year two. How are you enjoying it? Um, we heard a lot from these guys today about the AFL talent pathways. You've both been through through those, you in WA and Taylor in Victoria. I mean, tell us how important they were in your development as junior players coming into a, the AFL system. Yeah, I think uh, year two, and uh, I think speak for Taylor as well, it's been a lot a lot more difficult than, than year one and, and, and sauce it on the head. And the, the first year, it's all about you know, playing and how good this and... and the second, the second year gets it gets, gets a little bit tougher. But um, coming through coming through programs, especially with the AFL, uh, yes, um, it's, it was it was great for me personally. And um, I think Shobby talked about it before. It's it's not about you know being a great player. It's about becoming a better person. And um, so far, the move to Sydney, I've, I've loved it. And um, it's it's great to get out of that. Well, from for me personally, from Perth, where it's a you know footy is a big part of everyone's life, and to come come into Sydney where it's still growing. Um, it's great just to, to be able to enjoy what you're doing and um, grow the game. How difficult was it for you making that choice? We heard about it earlier, that choice between cricket and footy because you played both very well up until, I think you played under 16 state championships in cricket. Yeah. How difficult was that decision and what sort of pressure was there put on you from cricket, for instance, to, to stay with cricket? Yeah, it was it was difficult. I think if I played last night, I would have ended up with the same score as Clark and Callum. But, uh, <laughs> A few more years, but um, but I, I love I love both, and um, the, the, the both both codes are great. In the fact that uh, they let me decide and, and didn't didn't put real any pressure uh, whatsoever. I, I chatted to, to both and, and, and to the whacker, and you know, they're more than happy to let me decide um, my future. And um, yeah, looking pretty happy with where I'm at. So. 
What what swayed you in the end to go with football though? It was it wasn't anything um, that that I you know I didn't I didn't think about money. I didn't think about you know oh, I'm going to go to Western Sydney. Uh, could I stay home and play cricket in Perth? It wasn't anything about that. It, and um, speaking to you know the people that were close to me and especially my mum and dad, um, they didn't persuade me at all. They just said it's not going to be one day when you wake up and say, "Oh, I'm going to do this." It will just it will just happen. And um, yeah, footy with that for me was you know it, it suited my lifestyle. Was a year round thing. It was a professional, and um, I, I'm I'm really happy with with my call. Taylor, second year here in Western Sydney playing for the Giants. How are you finding it? Yeah, obviously, um, as Sos said. Yeah, it's been it's been a tough year for us young guys. Um, a lot a lot of hard yards have, have gone into this year. Um, coming off last year, where it was sort of um, sort of a bit of a fairy tale fairy tale year where, where all us young boys played a, a lot of games. Um, this year, we've sort of been brought back to reality um, in terms of not winning a game yet. Um, but we're still we're still staying positive. Um, really enjoying every challenge every week, um, and we see. Uh, Inside the club, there's a, there's a lot of improvement, um, and there's a lot of positives that come out of out of every game each week. So, I guess that's that's just the main thing to, to keep moving forward, and um, you know, to, to put the games that you know play so well behind us, and um, just look on look forward to the next week. What about the um, this, the feeling amongst the, the group? I mean, I'm I'm aware of it, obviously being involved in the club. This group of young players are all coming through. There's a sense that you're all coming through together, and you're all in this together. Just explain that for the people here in the room. I mean, how important is that? I guess, Steve, with you too, and you're, you know, you've obviously established some really good friendships. You took good friendships into this experience here at the Giants, but it's a very close, tight knit group, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You, you hit it on the head, and um, a, a lot of people always ask, you know, how, how's the transition to to Sydney? And you know, was it hard? Did you get homesick? And and for me personally, I don't know about Taylor, but um, I didn't really battle at all with it. So we, yeah, I came in where there was you know 12 draftees in my draft and a lot of other young players are at the same age and they're going through the exact same thing that you're going through and um, and it's it's been great. And I'm, I've, I've you know made some friendships that will hopefully last a lifetime and um, I think it will hold us in good stead uh, heading down the next few years when you know when we, when we do become hopefully a great a great side and um, clubs are. You know, want to want to poach some players where um, friendships and you know and real uh, loyalty and, and the bond that we've we're starting to form will hopefully uh, hold us in good stead. Taylor, I wanted to ask you. You've still got a lot of good mates back in Geelong, obviously where you come from, and um, some of them played with Casey Tatungu, uh, who unfortunately became a a quadriplegic last week in an unfortunate accident. He was a Geelong, Geelong VFL um, reserves player for a number of years, and you guys at the club have started a bit of a fundraising effort for, for Casey. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so um, as Nick just mentioned, that Casey was uh, involved in a freak accident uh, playing against my uh, old local club, uh, St. Joseph's. He plays for uh, South Barwon, um, where he was. He just had his head over the football um, and ran into one of the opposing players and uh, unfortunately got hit in the wrong spot, um, and he's dislocated a few of his vertebrae in... Um, Went into they called the game off and uh, he f- was flying up to Melbourne um, for treatment. Uh, the way that the, all the swelling went down, and unfortunately the uh, the family's confirmed that uh, as of Monday night he's a, a quadriplegic. Um, so obviously he's yeah the pretty crappy card in, in his hand, and um, you know it's a it's a big thing for him to deal with. Um, his his wife's uh, due to have a baby in November, um, and as Nick said. The boys at the club are just uh, really keen to um, do all they can to uh, help support him. Um, we've we've started a fundraiser, um, and we'd we'd love for anyone here today to um, you know put their hand up just to, to help out. Um, like, you know, no do- donations too small. Um, be re- yeah, really good to see people um, yeah help him out because yeah, obviously a pretty tough situation for him and his and his young family. So um, I think if you if, if you're keen to help out. Um, you speak to Nick, um, he, he can relay it to us and the, and the players and uh, we can definitely sort something out. Fantastic initiative, Taylor. Would you please thank Taylor Adams and Stephen Cornelio and we hope to see them back on the field soon. Before I hand over to one of our directors, Joseph Carozzi, to um, give a vote of thanks to our panel today and to everyone here for coming along, I also wanted to just, uh, on behalf of the club, also thank Price Waterhouse Coopers. 
this fantastic opportunity today here and please with that welcome Joseph Carozzi to give the vote of thanks. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to, uh, to everyone. Look, I, um, I'll be brief with the vote of thanks. It's clearly the, the, um, the group here benefited from a hell of a lot of learnings around what happens around the machinery of AFL um, on and off the field. And just listening to, to some of our, our superstar players, you can't be helped. You can't help but be moved by just the, the way that they, they react to, to the challenges that they're thrust um, in front of every weekend. Um, but one of the things I'd like to just leave you with is not just thanking you for spending time with us but, and telling us about the AFL perspective, but just the fact that for someone who, like me, is a recent convert to this game, having been a product of Western Sydney and a, a rugby league and soccer nut from a, a young age, um, the incredible awe that I think you generate, not because of your history, I don't know a lot of your history in many cases, but because of the talent that you show as leaders. And, you know, we all run businesses, we're all involved, large or small. And when you talk about talent development, I think there's no doubt that's what we all do, right? Whether it's, whether it's in a manufacturing industry, in a professional services firm, on a footy field. And a couple of the things that, that sort of struck home to me was, firstly, the importance of celebrating your alumni in business. And, you know, we've got some legends of the game here who have been retained by the game, and I think we've got to give credit, enormous credit to the AFL administration uh, and code for retaining alumni. And, and how often do we in our businesses have the going away parties and you sort of lose tens and twenties and thirties of years of corporate memory. And we don't often play that back and bring, bring our alumni back in to mentor our young, our young talent. So there's a huge learning that, that you guys have delivered to all of us as business leaders on just being, being careful to celebrate the alumni, the, your, your attitude to the game. You're, interestingly, Gus, with your question, your attitude about the way generations change, perceptions change, positive psychology versus the, the old military, deconstruct them and then reconstruct them. And I absolutely agreed with, with, with your comment. Life's moved on for the better in that respect. But we can take a hell of a lot of learning out of that. And the second thing is also all about um, focusing on the big picture. And, you know, we've got Gold Coast Suns, we've got the Giants, and we've got head office here. So within our businesses, you know, we are so focused on silos, whether it's state silos or functional silos, and the silos compete with each other, and both silos hate head office, right? Isn't that the sort of theory? Well, we've got head office here. We've got two silos competing. And I think the level of commitment that the group has to the code is a real lesson to us in business. So as part of my vote of thanks, let me say that I'm sure there, I'm speaking on behalf of everyone here, that we do support this code because of the way it's run. We support the code because of the quality of the talent that it produces. And we've, we've been fortunate to listen to you here today. But we also support it because we learn from what you're doing, not so much about the on-field, um, or in my case anyway, but so much about the leadership and the business ethics and values and judgment. So uh, on behalf of everybody here, thank you so much for taking your time. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your, your wisdom and observations. They are so relevant, much, much broader than, uh, than in uh, AFL territory. Please join me in thanking our panel. We do have, we do have a, uh, some token gifts, that the, the best sports science product ever developed, a glass of wine I think it is, that, uh, to share with you all. Um, and, and also on behalf of the, the, the players, we heard from, from, uh, from Cogs and, uh, and, and Taylor and, and also Dean Westbrooks, if he's still here. Thanks. Um, just watching these guys week in, week out, and in the case of the youngsters, you know, they were superstar players, are superstar players, but were superstar players as they went through school the lessons they are learning in how to cope with challenge, defeat, new opportunity, you know, media versus club versus family versus girlfriends versus all the rest of it, the community engagement. Um, and you watch them in, in my fortunate position on the board. Um, you know, I've got kids who are 21 and 19 and 17 and you guys set a huge benchmark. So don't ever 
lose sight of that fact that there's more there's more to you are to where you are today than the on-field performance. And also when it does come and uh, GWS meet Gold Coast Suns for the flag in say five years time, um, you'll still be the same. Those values won't change whether you win or lose. And uh, we really we're we're here as a collective coterie to support you as a club, and uh, we want to see you do well. And please thank for our uh, GWS coterie players for uh, coming along. That's all from me. Thank you so much for uh, being part of this, this group. Your support does mean a hell of a lot and uh, it will be repaid in short order um, by, by great performances and, and a great growing club. Um, there's an after party as there normally is. I understand, Dave, you've organised something across the road at the Shelbourne where uh, you can ask them all questions in a more intimate setting perhaps. But uh, feel free to join us for a, for a beer or a glass of wine or a glass of uh, mineral water across at the Shelbourne. Thanks very much for coming. Cheers. I don't know about that, but anyway.